let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Since it's the month of Halloween, or at least at the time of this recording, I feel it's only appropriate to talk about horror found in video games. Horror is the quality of something that causes feelings of fear, dread, and shock. And while it's exists in all forms of media like books, films, anime, manga, and even paintings, the horror genre has really found a home in video games. Putting the players in the middle of a spooky setting can potentially terrify the player more than any other medium can. The problem is that it's been pretty hit or miss. For every Silent Hill 2, there's an escape from Bug Island. Some games can horrify players, while others are just horrible. So what qualities make a good horror game? While I've not played every horror-themed game, I have found that the best ones share distinct qualities. And it's more than just good graphical fidelity, spooky music, and basic game design. But before we get into that, I feel it's important to understand why people enjoy being scared. I mean, why do people seek out horror in any media? Why look for something that is inherently designed to frighten you? Well, for a lot of people, it allows them to indulge in the pleasure of frightening themselves without actually being in danger. While some people may jump or lose control of their extremities when spooked, they know subconsciously that they aren't actually at risk of being harmed. This creates a very cathartic experience, allowing the players to feel a kind of fear and excitement that they typically don't get to experience in everyday life. The tension in horror media when building up to a big frighten and then the relief from a scare happening and the high from that excitement is very similar to riding a roller coaster or bungee jumping. In a way, being frightened by fictional stories also puts us at ease about the dangers and stresses of the real world, which in all honesty can be much more terrifying. For whatever reason, there are a lot of people that enjoy being scared. Though, while it might sound simple, causing an authentic feeling of horror requires a certain level of psychological understanding because you need to get into a person's head to really terrify them. And that's why I don't classify jump scares as true horror. Oh. Did that startle you? It's one thing to surprise someone with a random jump scare, but it's another to cause that genuine fear that really sits with someone. Hell, the first Lord of the Rings movie and Spider-Man 2 have jump scares, but that doesn't constitute them as horror movies. The thing is, the jump scares aren't actually scary, they just prey on our natural survival instincts. The jump is our body's reaction to a perceived threat, much like our reflexes reacting to incoming objects flying towards us. Our body naturally reacts out of self-preservation. The reason jump scares are utilized in films and games so much is because it's an immediate spike in adrenaline for the viewer that fizzles out as quickly as it comes, hence why many people enjoy them. But again, it doesn't have that same feeling of fear that horror is about. That isn't to say good horror games can't utilize jump scares, but if that's all it has, the excitement from them wears off pretty quickly and just becomes exhausting due to your body constantly being excited, hence why games like Five Nights at Freddy's are best in short bursts. So now we come back to the original question, what makes a good horror game? And when I say good, I'm specifically talking about how scary the game is, which by definition is the main focus of horror games. There are four qualities that I found define a quality horror game, and how well they execute them dictates their general scariness. First, there's limited control. In film, you see through a specific lens, usually through a character's perspective or an omnipresent angle. While film builds up suspense by hiding the threat that endangers the characters, the audience has no control over what the characters might do. You as a viewer are subject to the whims of the filmmaker, which is great if you need to cover your eyes and watch through your hands, but I would argue for this reason that it doesn't have the same type of investment people get from games. In horror games, you are the one in control of the protagonist's actions, but that can be even more terrifying. Being in control of the characters makes it easier to be immersed in the events going on, which is essential to a good horror experience. If the player isn't engrossed in the events transpiring within the game, it's harder for them to be scared by them. Having the player in the role of the protagonist also adds a layer of empathy, because you are the character. Any harm that befalls them essentially is happening to you, or at least that's how it feels for an immersed player. We will be seeing more and more of this as virtual reality continues to develop, as it is currently the most immersed a player can be which is why many people are scared slash curious about the prospects of horror VR games. By giving the player control of what they can see, the creators can also create fear of what the players can't see, always fearing what is just outside their peripherals. This is where the sound design of a horror game can be vital to the experience, 
Adding in footsteps or bumps can put the player on edge of what might be behind them, just out of sight, which only builds the tension for them. Horror games can't give the player too much control though, hence why I specified limited control. The player having agency is the defining quality of video games, but in the horror genre, this has to be restricted in order to make the player feel exposed. Limiting the player's control disempowers them, the opposite of what most other video games genres attempt to do, where you can wipe out multiple enemies in seconds. By disempowering them, the player will feel vulnerable, which in turn makes them more susceptible to scares. In order to do this, the protagonists of many horror games are typically a weak, everyday person that's been put in an unfortunate setting. Like James Sunderland from Silent Hill 2, Miles from Outlast, or the cast of Until Dawn for example. This is why combat mechanics tend to be make or break in the horror genre, because if the player is too well armed or powerful, it demeans any threat they may face, which removes any fear that said threat can create. While it may meet some of the later requirements for horror, Doom is anything but frightening because, well, you're Doom guy. You can blast a demon with a shotgun before using your bare fist to finish them off, or simply chainsaw them in half, so it's pretty hard to be scared by the legions of hell trying to hurt you. On the other hand, Resident Evil balances combat by requiring the player to stop in place in order to fire their weapon, which can put them in danger almost as much as running away if they aren't aware of their surroundings. The games also make ammunition sparse, so the player has to be careful about how well they use what they do find, and not shoot randomly until everything is dead, like they might in traditional shooters. Every encounter with enemies has to be calculated or else risk danger later on. In order to avoid having combat be the main gameplay focus, majority of horror games incorporate puzzles for the player to solve instead. Trying to escape an environment that you're trapped in can make puzzles a tense obstacle to overcome. Fetching pieces or figuring out the solution to a challenging puzzle can make the player feel helpless. Though if it's too obtuse or difficult, it can be more frustrating than frightening. Managing an inventory with puzzle items, weapons, and ammunition can also make the player have to decide between progression and protection. The player having to search for key items to solve puzzles also facilitates them having to search through dark, isolated areas. Which brings me to the next key factor for horror games. Darkness and isolation. Many horror-related games aren't even about defeating the monster or triumphing over the bad guy, but simply surviving whatever horror you're trapped in, which is where the title Survival Horror came from. For this to be scary, it requires the player to feel isolated, another factor in making the player feel vulnerable. Humans are naturally a social animal, which is why many people feel uncomfortable when by themselves. For example, have you ever been home alone and even though you know no one's there, you feel it's necessary to check behind yourself just to make sure? That's an evolutionary fear because we as humans feel vulnerable when alone, since there will be no one there to help if a predator were to attack us. So in order to make a game as tense and frightening as possible, it requires the player to feel isolated because having other characters there to help is comforting. Even though she's the more vulnerable one, protecting Ashley Graham in RE4 makes the game less frightening due to the fact that you're protecting someone, so the player feels empowered in a way, much like the confidence you might get when you watch a horror movie with someone that's more easily scared than you. Going one step further, the co-op game design is one of the reasons that Resident Evil 5 and 6 were much less frightening than their predecessors, due to the fact that there's always another character with equal combat abilities there to help when any type of threat appears. Revelations 2 slightly cracks this by splitting gameplay duties between two characters, one acting as a spotter, locating hidden enemies, and another character as the only one who can actually fight zombies. Though there is still comfort in having another player or NPC to help you, which is exactly why horror and co-op don't necessarily play well together. A way to create tension with other human characters though is to subvert the player's expectations of what those other characters are there for. Usually when you encounter non-hostile NPCs, they're there to assist you in some way or simply to populate an area. In Silent Hill 2, however, most humans that the player finds that aren't monsters tend to feel off in some way. Me too. I'm looking for my mama. I, I mean my mother. It's been so long since I've seen her. I 
thought my father and brother were here, but I can't find them either. I I'm sorry. It's not your no, problem. I, I hope you find them. Yeah, you too. Making the other characters act and speak strangely without being threatening can actually make the player feel more isolated because it makes it seem that they're the only sane one left in the town and highlights that there's no one there to help them. Call of Cthulhu Dark Corners of the Earth does something very similar at the start of the game, being set in the town of Innsmouth. And anybody who's read Shadows over Innsmouth knows that the citizens of the town aren't exactly fond of strangers. Could you help out a stranger to this fine port? Are you being funny? No, not at all. I'm after directions to the First National. I hear they have a store in town. Innsmouth don't take too kindly to them from out of town. Get lost, stranger. Yet, while being trapped in a city full of fish people may feel uncomfortable, nothing is more isolating than darkness. When we are left alone in the dark, we feel alone. Humans have a primordial fear of the dark, again going back to the fear that a predator may be lurking where we can't see them, hence why we gravitate towards light. This is why creating fear in daylight is hard to do, which is why horror games traditionally are set at night or in locations that inhibit natural light from coming in. Putting the player in a dark setting can make them feel unsettled, because some monster or ghost could be hiding in the shadows waiting to pounce. The Silent Hill games use the fog covering the titular town in a very similar way, obscuring anything that isn't right next to the main character in a thick haze, meaning something sinister could be right in your path and you can't even see it. A key factor to darkness in horror games though is that the setting can't be too dark. If the player can't see anything but a black screen, it dilutes any suspense that the darkness brings. It has to feel like the shadows are encroaching the player, trapping them, so light is needed to balance it out. The little details you can see are what really creates the feeling of dread. This is why incorporating light is important, and game designers can even use the player's inclination to go towards light sources as a way to guide them and even frighten them. Using flashlights and torches are another way for the player to have control of what they can see while in the dark but still limit how much, building on that fear of the unknown, which is the next factor of a good horror game. To quote H.P. Lovecraft, the oldest and strongest emotion of mankind is fear, and the oldest and strongest kind of fear is fear of the unknown. Humans are comforted by the familiar, whether it be your own bed, your family, your house, your job, things that give us a sense of stability and the feeling that we have some type of control. Inversely, we fear the unknown because it's something we have absolutely no control over, which is why Lovecraft's works usually focus on characters facing unfathomable horrors that can't even be understood. The best horror games feed off this fear of the unknown. For example, when I played Bloodborne the first time, all the werewolves and other monsters didn't even faze me because they were all things I'd seen before, but when I came upon Amygdala for the first time, I was actually kind of terrified. Even after confirming it couldn't hurt me, I was still cautious while approaching it due to the fact I couldn't really understand what it was, which made me wary, and this could be said for many of the later bosses in the game as well. While not in something that's specifically a horror game, the gaping dragon in Dark Souls 1 is very similar, first appearing to be a small alligator before revealing to be the giant monstrosity it really is. The first encounter with this boss is a big note moment for a lot of players due not only to its size, but how it's hard to even wrap your brain around what you're even looking at. To keep this fear of the unknown though, it has to stay unknown. Have you ever watched a scary movie where, after the monster was explained near the end of the film, you stop being as scared as you were in the beginning? You're no longer as scared because what was unknown is now known. 99% of the time it's best not to explain the horror because when you understand how and why an entity or monster acts, it removes a lot of its perceived threat and allows you to even possibly sympathize with it. It's easier to comprehend the danger, thus you can logically face your fear. Zombies will never have the same scare appeal they did in the 50s and 60s, when they were first introduced, due to the fact we know everything about them, and the popularization of the zombie genre, especially in video games, has only furthered this. Werewolves, vampires, and other classic monsters have a similar issue after decades of exposure to them over multiple media. Explaining the threat to the player effectively empowers them with knowledge. 
Though, due to the visual and interactive nature of games, it's hard to keep something unknown to the player for long, and in that case, the unnatural can be a good horror substitute. I mean, anything can be scary if put into the right context. Or would it be wrong context at that point? This requires taking something ordinary and twisting it in subtle ways. Hospitals, which is where we go to get better after getting sick, become eerie when abandoned and dilapidated. We find children in horror settings spooky because it warps the normal image of how kids typically act, being more silent and mysterious than typically portrayed, which makes us feel uncomfortable, like there's something we don't know. Animatronics at a kid's pizza parlor are designed to appear friendly, but due to the uncanny valley effect, what is meant to be comforting can be quite unsettling, especially at night. Even giving something an abnormal or jittery movement can scare us because, in our minds, it's not natural. It's not something we can explain logically, which frightens us. Adding an unnatural movement to something also adds an element of unpredictability to it, which is the last element to a well-crafted horror experience. Making the player feel uncertain to what they will find next is key to a good frighten, as it causes the player to question what they will find around the next corner. This is one of the toughest aspects of the horror genre because it requires the game to constantly subvert the player's expectations. If the player can expect what to find, it's hard for them to be scared. Predictability is the bane of horror in games. Having played Resident Evil 4 more times than I can count, there's nothing in this game that will ever scare me again. I know where every scripted event is, where most jump scares are hidden, and the look of every monster, all things that ruin any tension the game might try to create. Even playing a game a second time can decrease the game's spook factor significantly because you're aware when scares are designed to happen. Unpredictability is also difficult because the human mind is designed to find patterns. Horror-themed TV shows are best as anthologies for this exact reason, due to the fact it's hard to be frightened by something you've become familiar with and can see the pattern to. Case in point, having a predictable design is the major flaw in Layers of Fear. Throughout the game, the mansion it is set in begins to warp in eerie, unpredictable ways. Or at least that's how it starts out. By the mid-game, when you exit through a door you entered in, you can be certain it's going to lead to a different room or hallway than it originally connected to. This is when it stops being scary because you know what's going to happen, which removes the spooky effect that this is supposed to create. In comparison, the design of PT is quite brilliant at keeping the player on edge. As a playable teaser, it's set in a single hallway, and anytime the player walks through the door at the end of the hall, they return to where they entered from. PT avoids this from becoming predictable by having its infinite hallway broken into two sections through a 90 degree turn. The first part of the hallway typically stays the same, but the other half changes with every loop. At first it's nothing, but as the player progresses, things become more and more sporadic. And it's that feeling that anything might be around the corner that creates that feeling of dread as you get closer to that turn. Overall though, creating feelings of fear and dread is something that requires a lot of thought, going beyond having something jump out at the player saying boo. Limited control, isolation, darkness, the unknown, the unnatural, and the unpredictable are all elements that are needed in building that looming sense of terror in games that will keep someone up at night. There are a lot of things that bother us on a deep psychological level, and it's really tough to understand those ingrained ticks. But once someone can tap into those deep-seated fears hidden in the human subconscious, that's when you can get that feeling of genuine horror.